Hello everybody, this is Jake coming at you from Jake's Math Lessons TV and uh, today I'm going to be talking about piecewise functions and continuity. Specifically I'm going to be going through this problem right here. Um, find the values of a and b that make f continuous everywhere where f is defined as this piecewise function here. Um, so I'm going to be kind of going through what you want to think about when you're doing a problem like this. Um, first thing that you want to really think about when you're when you see a problem like this um, you want to think about each of those three pieces on their own first and make sure that each of those three is continuous within their own domain and then once you have checked that um, then you can you know kind of make sure that they're continuous when you go from piece to piece so um, we'll start with this first piece here where f is uh, when x is less than two f is going to be defined as x squared minus 4 over all over x minus 2. Um, <clears throat> so in general, when you're looking for discontinuities, these three things here are the main, main things that you're going to kind of look out for. Um, clearly, we don't have a square root to worry about here, so we're not going to have to worry about taking the square root of a negative number or any even root. That would cause a problem, but we don't have any of that here. Um, and then, obviously, we don't have a log anywhere <clears throat> either. So we aren't going to need to worry about taking the log of 0 or a negative number. We're not going to need to worry about taking the square root of a negative. So we can ignore these in this problem, but in general, those are good things to look out for. However, we do want to be careful that we aren't dividing by 0. Um, because we do have a fraction here, which means we are doing some division somewhere in the problem. Um, so <clears throat> we need to make sure that we're not dividing by zero, which means we need to make sure that this denominator here is not zero. So all we have to do is take that x minus two, make sure that it does not equal zero. Clearly, as long as x is not two, that will not be a problem. So <clears throat> as long as x is not two, we won't ever divide by zero. Notice we're only using this function when x is less than two. So this function won't even be used when x is two, therefore, this function will be continuous on the entire domain that it's actually used. So as a result, we know that this first piece isn't going to cause any problems for us. Um, then going into the second piece here, this, this is how f is defined when x is between 2 and 3. This function here, so keep in mind that a and b are constants. This function here is um, a polynomial, right? Because we just have some constant times an x squared term, plus or minus some constant times an x term, plus some other constant. So this here is just a, a polynomial. This is kind of generally what a polynomial looks like, right? We have some constant term, some constant term times an x, some constant term times an x squared, and so on and so on and so on. As long as we just have some constant times x to some integer power, and that's what all of our terms are, that'll be a polynomial, which this clearly is. So the thing about polynomials is they are continuous everywhere. For any x value you could plug into them, it's going to be continuous. So as a result, you know, if ax squared minus bx plus 3 is continuous everywhere, obviously it's going to be continuous on this domain that we actually care about. So this piece isn't going to cause any problems for us. And then lastly, this piece here, when x is greater than 3, again, we have a polynomial here. Right, we just have some constant times an x term. These are actually going to combine into one single constant term. But again, this is just a polynomial. Therefore, it's continuous everywhere. Therefore, it's continuous on the domain that we actually care about. So each of these three pieces by themselves aren't going to cause any problems for us. Um, but what we need to look for now is to make sure that when we go from, you know, when we get as we approach x equals 2 from the left, and as we get to t x equals 2, and then go to the right of it, and we'll basically be going from this function to this one, we need to make sure that they line up so that we're not jumping up or down. Because if, if we don't make sure they line up, we, we may be getting something like this, for example. Right, so as we get to 2 from the left, we don't want to have to jump up to the next function. We want them to line up so that we can smoothly go from one function to the other. <coughs> so to do that, 
what we need to do is prove <clears throat> or make sure rather that um, that this function f is continuous at x equals 2. So we're going to use the limit definition of what it means for a function to be continuous at x equals 2, which is this right here. So we need to make sure that this equation holds true. However, as we look at this function, <clears throat> to the left of 2, we're going to be using this function here, and to the right of 2, we're going to be using this function here. So <clears throat> our left and right-sided limits aren't going to be we're not going to use the same f. So as a result, we need to kind of break this up. Find First deal with our left-sided limit, then deal with our right-sided limit. So let's start with the left. Um, remember, from the left, we, are, we have x values that are a little bit smaller than 2. So we're going to be using this function here. So from the left, we have this as our f. And then when we're finding this f of 2 here, this middle function here is the one that's defined when x equals 2. <clears throat> so this is the function that we're going to use for f of 2. So doing that, we would get something like this, right? This is our f of x when we have x values that are a little bit less than 2. And then when f is 2, um, or when x is 2, we just need to plug in 2 into f to get that. So that'll give us something like this here. <clears throat> now, just to kind of simplify that a bit, we get an equation like this. Um, I will go take this a little further in a second, but before I do that, let's talk about the right-sided limit real quick. So remember, this was the function that we used for x um, a little bit less than 2, but now we're approaching from the right. So now we have x values that are a little bigger than 2. Therefore, we're going to be using this function, right? Because... Um, that's the function that is defined, sorry, not there, here. When x is a little bigger than 2, <clears throat> we use this function. Right, so now this is the function when x is a little bigger than 2. <clears throat> that's also the function when x is 2. So now we're using that on both sides of our equation. So if we take this a step further and evaluate this limit, we'll see that we have the same thing on the left and the right. So that's not really going to tell us anything useful. So really, we just need to worry about um, our left-sided limit up here. So let's take that and you know kind of proceed with that. <clears throat> um, clearly, to evaluate this limit, we can't just plug in 2 because we're going to divide by 0, which is impossible. So therefore, we need to kind of think about how we can simplify this. One thing we can do is use uh, difference of squares to factor out this numerator here. So difference of squares just says that if we have two squared things, one being subtracted from the other, we can factor that out as the first thing minus the second thing times the first thing plus the second thing. All right, so that's all we did here. Our squares are just x and 2. x squared minus 2 squared gives you 4. So x squared minus 4. <clears throat> it can be factored out like this. Now notice we have an x minus 2 on the top and the bottom. So those can actually cancel out. And all we'll have on the left is just the limit of x plus 2. Now to evaluate this, we can basically just plug in 2 for x. <clears throat> so 2 plus 2 gives you 4. Now I'll just kind of get this 3 over on the left side just so we have our constants all together. So that'll give us... 1 equals 4a minus 2b. So notice this is good, it's nice and simplified, but we have two variables and only one equation. In order to solve for two variables, or I guess they're constants, but two unknown constants, um, you need at least two equations, right? If you want to solve three unknown constants, you need three, three equations. Um, you know, basically the number of of unknowns you're trying to solve for, you need at least that many equations. So we're going to need another equation that relates a and b. So where that will come from <clears throat> is making sure that it's continuous at 3, right? Because we just got that other equation making sure it's continuous at 2. So as long as this equation holds up, it'll be continuous at 2. But we also need to make sure that f is continuous at 3. So same thing. Now we want to take the limit as x approaches 3 and make sure that that equals f of 3. So this is just using the limit definition to prove that we're continuous at 3. And again, from the left and the right, we have these two different 
parts of our piecewise function that we're using. So we need to break it down into our left-sided and our right-sided limit. So first, the left-sided limit. Notice from the left, when x is a little smaller than 3, we need to use this equation. When x equals 3, so when we're finding our f of 3, we're going to be using this one. And also when x is a little bigger than 3, so for our right-sided limit, we're also going to use this function. So our left-sided limit, remember we use this function from the left of 3. And then we use, you know, this this middle function from the left, this right function from the, or at three. So plugging in three there gives you this, and then putting our f from the left gives us this. Now, just to simplify a bit, and we'll even go ahead, since this is a, a pretty simple limit, all we really need to do is plug in three for our x. We can get this equation here, and then just to simplify on the right, um, so again, notice that uh, the left, left and right side of our equation here are not the same. So this will be useful, and uh, we'll come back to this in a second. But real quick, touching on the right-sided limit, this is going to be a case where we're using the same function for this limit over here as we are at x equals 3. So notice, again, um, just like we got from the right-sided limit at 2, at x equals 2, when x equals 3, our right-sided limit is also going to do the same thing, right? We have the same thing on the left and the right side of our equation. So this isn't going to tell us anything useful. This, will, this left side will always equal this right side no matter what a and b are. So that doesn't help us figure out what a and b are. However, this is useful, so we'll proceed with that. Um, now, really, just to simplify this, um, you know, obviously just square square the three, multiply those, um, and then <clears throat> we'll just kind of move things all to the same, <clears throat> same side of the equation. So we'll move, um, we'll move all our a's over here, we'll move our b over here, and we'll move our constant over here. So just subtract the three, add the a, subtract the b, simplifies to here. So now notice we have another equation which relates a and b. So now we have two equations relating a and b, two equations, two unknown constants. Now we can use those together, right? This first one here is what we got from making sure it's continuous at x equals 2. And this is what we got from making sure that f is continuous at x equals 3. So now we just have a system of equations. Now we can use them together. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and put the switch this. Uh, sorry. Um, no, so what we're going to go ahead and do now is solve this system of equations. So a couple different ways you can do that. I'm going to go ahead and use substitution. Um, so what I'm going to do is take this first equation here, and I'm going to solve for b, and then we'll take that b value and then plug it into our second equation. So it's just subtracting 4a over to the other side. Um, will give us this, and then we'll divide by negative 2. Divide by negative 2. That'll give us negative 1 half. Our negatives will cancel here, giving us positive 2a. So b is negative 1 half plus 2a, or 2a minus 1 half. So now we'll take this b, and we'll plug this into our b for this second equation, and that'll give us an equation with just one variable, right? So now we just have... A, right? We have no more B's. So now that we just have one variable, we'll go ahead and just solve it. So we'll distribute that, combine our like terms here, and subtract 2 over to the other side, and then divide this 2 from this 2A, divide that over there. <clears throat> so that'll just give us, you know, minus the 2 over gives you 2A equals 1. Divide by 2, a is 1 half. So now we know if a is 1 half, that's, you know, what's required for our function f to be continuous everywhere. Now what we can do is take this a equals 1 half, and remember we, we found a second ago that, that b equals 2a minus 1 half. Now we can just plug that a in there and simplify that, giving us b equals 1 half and a equals 1 half. So... <clears throat> that's it. We know if a and b are both one half, if we go back to our original f over here, if a and b are both one half, 
and we plug those in for A and B here, here, and here, the resulting piecewise function will be continuous everywhere. And we just 